Welcome to the Why God Why podcast. My name is Peter Englert. Uh, I am one of the co-hosts here, Nathan Yoder, who is our illustrious producer. Aaron Mercer, our fantastic communications director, also co-host. Wow. What, Thank what? You had to be back again. I mean, hey, I appreciate it. I feel like we've kind of made a permanent decision. <laughs> it's a definite maybe. Um, it's a definite maybe. It's a definite maybe. So we are in the midst of a series. This podcast is brought to you by Browncroft Community Church. And this series is brought to you by Northeastern Seminary at Roberts Wesleyan College. We're interviewing some of their faculty and staff on questions that you might have. Today, we are talking with David Carr, who is an assistant professor. And we're responding to the question, why is the Bible best read in community? Aaron, yeah. what are your thoughts? I'm I'm excited about this conversation. I think it's a it's going to be a really good one. Um, I love uh, you know the historical expertise we have here. I love history. Peter knows that. Um, but uh, I think this is a great conversation, both from an academic sense, but also, I mean, so many of our uh, listeners, I think, are probably either interested in. They may not even be going to church yet, but they might be going to a small group. But why, you know, thinking about why why is that even important? Um, so I'm I'm real excited about this conversation. Oh man, I don't have anything to add to that. That's great, David. <laughs> let's just jump in. Hey, All right. introduce yourself to the listeners and just maybe tell you know tell us how excited you got. You know, this is your life passion. How'd you get here? All right. So I'm. Uh, my name is David Carr. Um, there are a number I've discovered of famous David Carrs out there on social media, and I'm commonly mistaken for one of the more interesting, well-known David Carrs online. Um, but You had a better quarterback career, let's <laughs> just say that. <laughs> <laughs> right, I, I have been tagged on Twitter as, as pe- people think that I'm him when I'm, I'm not. But I, I'll go into those stories maybe another time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm from a small town in South Georgia. I grew up in the church. Um, uh, since the call to ministry early in my life, I uh, went to Fuller Theological Seminary, and uh, about midway through, um, sort of discovered the, um, the, the unending journey that is theological education, right? And I, I started reading scholarship for the first time and thought, where has this been my whole life? Mm. And uh, truth be told, when I first started, I don't know if, if this is a bit premature to get into these kinds of stories, but... Um, early on in my seminary career, I was convinced that as much as I enjoyed learning and as much as I was eating up uh, the scholarship that I was kind of getting my hands on, that I, I assumed that I would always be hopelessly reliant on experts to tell me how to read the Bible or to tell me what it meant. I thought I'll never be a historian, I'll never be X, Y, or Z, so I'm always going to do my best but rely on commentators or whoever. And so it was about halfway through my seminary experience when I um, was forced to do a number of assignments, reading the text on my own, turning in a handful of interpretive assignments, and, and sort of just getting all I could get out of the text on my own. And then I started going to commentaries and scholars later and finding, holy cow, the things I'm finding and talking about, they're talking about, and I did it without them leading me there. And mm. I felt for the first time in my life that I was becoming a truly empowered uh, reader of the Bible. And since then, it's it's kind of been my goal to help other people to to experience that same kind of transformation in their in in, in their abilities and their capacities and a, a true sense of empowerment in their own reading of the Bible. So from there, I, I went back to Georgia, actually, um, to Candler School of Theology, did another master's degree, and then a PhD at Emory University, and now I'm here teaching biblical studies at Northeastern Seminary. Wow. Made the shift to Rochester from the south. That's right. Uh, I, I saw more snow in my first five or six months here than I think <laughs> I'd seen in my entire <laughs> life prior to that point. That's right. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, I so what, what uh, was there a... You mentioned how you saw different uh, commentaries, and you had you had started to think about similar questions without even being prodded that way. Um, I mean, was there a certain a certain uh, book in the Bible that really was kind of like an aha moment for you, or maybe it was 
a certain period of church history uh, that you were reading about? Was there kind of an aha moment that got you into this? I, I'd say that there was a there was a series of aha moments. Okay. Um, but I, I do remember um, specifically reading the letters of Paul and reading First Corinthians in in the class I was just referencing, and reading um, Paul's uh, exhortations and instructions on the Lord's Supper um, in First Corinthians 11. And I grew up, um, I'm in the United Methodist Church now, but I grew up, I didn't grow up in that tradition. And I, I remember growing up, um, and it, you know, uh, when we would take uh, the Lord's Supper together as a church, sitting in my pew, um, terrified, because I, I thought that, you know, when Paul says you eat and drink judgment on yourselves, I, I, I remember thinking, I need to remember and repent of every sin I've ever done before I take this sip or I'm going to fall over dead in my pew, right? And, and I remember going to that text and reading it closely and carefully and thinking, that's not what this is saying at all. Like, this is a communal meal, and this is what's actually happening. And I realized a practice... Um, that I had engaged with in the church for my whole life suddenly took on a different perspective and a new meaning. And I was actually challenged to think about it differently. And so that that was a moment that was very personal for me, but also one of those, aha, a close reading of this text in its ancient context can can call me can cause me to to see something radically different than I did before. Mm. Yeah. So Let's kind of jump to, we'll come back to kind of even your time in education, you know, as a student, but I, I want to kind of talk to you as a teacher. Um, and I feel like I can bring this up. I have a master's degree and probably the best part of my education was the conversations in class. Yeah. Because all of a sudden now, all the assumptions I took about on the Bible and I bring them up to the surface. So do you prod some of the controversy in the class or do you prod conversation, you know, help people understand? Because, I mean, our questions about why should I read the Bible in community, we're coming here with the assumption. I mean, I just want to tell you, you should do that. But <laughs> right. I think kind of helping our listeners understand why, even from your perspective, would be great. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It's a it's a big topic and an important one. Um, on, on the prodding, I, I would say that prodding is probably putting it lightly. Um <laughs> And I don't. I don't mean that I. Uh, I, I don't mean that I um, am aggressive with, with you know pushing things on my students or anything like that. I actually always begin, uh, and I tell every class this at the beginning of the semester. Um, my teaching slogan has become "I don't care what you think," and <laughs> and I don't mean that to sound like a bully. And then I unpack what I mean by it is I'm not invested in them landing somewhere specific theologically. I'm not um, requiring that they come away agreeing with me or any of the textbooks. I simply want them to think more clearly about why they have landed where they have landed after they've worked through the material. So I, I always, I begin with that, but then I, I um, intentionally every semester um, make sure that we're, uh, I, I try my best to address topics that not only arise from the text, but that intersect directly with big important issues in our society right now. So, what's the what's the most recent topic that comes straight to your head, and what did that conversation look like? It, it's funny because um, the most recent one, I, I just finished a semester and in in starting a new one, right? So, if to kind of plot it out, we talk about. Um, questions about scientific and historical accuracy and what difference one view versus another makes. We talk about violence in the Bible. We talk about gender and sexuality. We talk about race and ethnicity. We talk about um, politics and prophecy. But the, the most recent and the only one that I find people actually get, in my classes at least, angry about is when we talk about money. And <laughs> oh. um, I, um, it's happened two or three times where people get angry when we read James and what um, the epistle of James uh, says about rich people. And uh, I, I've had people swear, you know, say things like, I'm, I'm a passionate Bible-believing Christian, but I, I think James may be wrong. 
<laughs> and I'm thinking, wow, this was totally un- I've had that response at least two or three times in the past few years. Well, I mean, to be fair, they're in good company with Martin Luther. So that's right. Yeah, you're they're right. If, if listeners may not be aware, Martin Luther called James an epistle of straw. Uh, it didn't give him the gospel in its fullest extent like he wanted. And so, yeah, they're in, they're in good company. They're not the only Christians who have thought this, for sure. <laughs> wow. That's, uh, th- it sounds like, I mean, it sounds like a, I want to be in that classroom and listen to that conversation. i um, not sure I should say anything in the middle of it. But, uh, mm-hmm. no, I, I, I think that's, that's, really, uh, that's really cool. So what you have these, these great conversations in your, your classroom. Um, when you you say that you um, prod people in a nice, well, maybe even in a forceful way sometimes to get them to be reading and talking. And um, what do you do? You know, you, you're, you're working at a seminary and, and, you know, I'm sure a lot of the people in your classes are looking to apply the practices you're pushing. Uh, mm-hmm. not, not pushing is the wrong word. Prodding them to do <laughs> to then apply that to whatever ministry context they're in or whatever other context they're in. Um, what are you hoping they do with that? What are you hoping that, where do you want them to take that, what you're modeling in the class, how do you want them to apply that to their own church, their own ministry? Maybe it's even just a, maybe it's a Bible study amongst friends. Um, you know, what, what are you hoping comes out of that? I would say at least, uh, a couple of things. One is, um, I don't, as you, as my earlier comments may have, um, indicated, I, I don't think it's my job to give people the answers, right? Or the perspective. I always joke that I have the right perspective and the answers, and so I could if I wanted to. I just don't want to, right? And so, but in all seriousness, I, I, my, one of my goals is to help students realize the complexity and the consequences of the ways that we interpret the Bible in, in real, in real material life stuff, right? Of, of our, um, to recognize that what we take for granted as a reading of the Bible or an approach to the Bible that's just normal for any person who's thinking correctly about it, right? That, that we can't take that for granted and that actually reading the Bible in its ancient context and then trying to bring those writings to bear on our contemporary context actually involves a lot of um, surprisingly complex processes that need to be engaged and interrogated and considered. And so one of my goals is to help people um, see um, the the challenges and the complexities of what we're doing, but also in hopes that it will help them become lifelong learners, right? So that by not giving what I think is the way to do it on any given topic, but more um, pointing in directions and giving resources, I hope that people will go on to reflect in their communities um, about the complexities of these of these matters. But also, um, I would say as well, I, I want people to um, to go to to leave my classes and to leave our seminary degree willing and open to encounter difference. Mm. that that um that by giving students an array of options and having us all including myself wrestle with the various options on the table um it it normalizes i think or makes more um kind of uh, normative it normalizes encounters with difference different viewpoints different perspectives different life experiences and i i think those kinds of encounters with difference are vital for um, truly deep learning. Mm. So let me, I, I want to push you a little bit. I want to mm-hmm. go back to the money conversation. You know, you brought up, you know, the complexities and complications. Walk us through that discussion and passage just a little bit of, you know, if someone's reading it, because I think even what you're saying is, and I'll just use myself, I am a, white American who grew up in upstate New York my whole life. So I read that passage very different than a brother or sister from China or from India or someone from, you know, I read it very different than Augustine read it. So help us, Mm -hmm. help us kind of see that, why that's important through that passage. Yeah. So James in, um, James and James two, I didn't, and I didn't bring a text with me, but James two, 
discusses issues of socioeconomic difference and um, um, preferential treatment of people with wealth and uh, over and against those who don't have it within their communal gatherings, whatever those gatherings were. Um, but then in chapter five, James really um, lays into people who um, have stored up wealth and have uh, a seem from the text itself, it, it, it seems that they have perhaps relied on their wealth, but they've certainly gained their wealth through um, robbing people of due wages, right? And so there's an inequality that's been created by the wealthy in that context. Um, but that's just one writing. And so what I... I, I typically begin uh, this kind of conversation with by quoting actually my doctoral advisor saying um, something along the lines of the Bible talks consistently about wealth and possessions, but it doesn't talk about wealth and possessions consistently. That there are some tensions and some different viewpoints perhaps, and there's some um, there's a diversity of text that we have to wrestle with and put into conversation with one another. And so. Um, I, I think I begin by simply asking students what do they think is going on, but then asking, having us all reflect on who the wealthy are in our context. Because like you've described, I, I too am a, a white male with a PhD who grew up in um, middle class America and in the larger landscape of our you know global context, I'm, I'm in the the highest percentile, the wealthiest people who have ever lived on earth, you know, probably that, that even, even in our current context, I have more money than the overwhelming majority of the world, even though I feel like I, I, I don't feel rich. And so then I began to ask, um, to, to consider issues of readerly empathy, like who, who are, who's, who are they addressing? Because we can often read the Bible and think it's talking about someone else. But if I assume that I'm the rich and then consider how my own actions and my, um, my work, my employment, the ways I spend my money may have had impacts on people with less money than me, then all of a sudden I'm challenged because I'm the target of this text. And so that's kind of a, the general direction I tend to take and, and open it up to conversations with students and, and see where it might lead. Well, you know, it's fascinating because, you know, one of the most famous pastors in America, Andy Stanley, wrote a whole book and he does a series every year called Be Rich. Mm -hmm. And he like literally lays out that point. He goes, oh, okay. if you make over like $25,000 a year, yep. you're literally in the top 10%. And I'm probably going to get money wrong, but like, yeah. it's, it's not like a hundred thousand dollars. Right. So it's just, I find that fascinating because, you know, he wrote a whole book on it. We did a series on it. So, you know, it's funny that you brought up with everything that happened this last year, you brought up money, that that's kind of the sticking right. point. <laughs> right, right. And and I think that that's to return to the, the kind of the, the main topic of this conversation, reading in community, right? If I um, only read, not, reading in community, just the bare fact of reading in community, just reading with a group of people is um, most of the time I would think, preferential or better than reading always in isolation. But um, the bare fact or the practice of reading in community in and of itself isn't sufficient, I don't think, to address some of the biggest pressing concerns like something like um, wealth inequality or, or economic justice that we face in our context. That if I am reading only in, in groups and communities of people who represent my demographics, then I'm not going to encounter that difference to the same extent, mm -hmm. right? So my wife is a social worker and in Atlanta and before that in LA, she, her, her, her job was to help um, people who are homeless find permanent supportive housing and employment. Like she was, she was um, moving people from the streets into housing, mm -hmm. right? And in Atlanta, she was involved at times in a Bible study that was fully, almost fully composed of nothing but people who were homeless at that moment in their lives. It was, it was a, a homeless Bible study. And um, while she was attending those, I was in a doctoral seminar with other people of my shared status 
um, studying these texts, but how much different might my experience have been if I regularly read with the people with whom my wife was reading, mm. right? And, and what, what in difference of a perspective might I have encountered? And I am therefore, um, because I didn't read in those contexts, my own biblical interpretation suffered mm. as, a, as a result. This is uh, this is really interesting, and I, I uh, so I wonder the thought, the question that came to my mind was, you know, you're talking about reading in community with your, you know, the students are reading together, the students in your class, mm -hmm. um, or uh, you could apply that to other contexts like uh, small groups or um, other, like your wife's setting that you mentioned, but uh, so I'm curious, like in your when you are reading together to get a better sense of what you're reading. Um, I mean, would I be right to think that you probably look at what are the comment? You mentioned commentaries. Or do you look at like some classic commentaries and things like that? Um, so I'm curious, like, where do you go to? F where do you tend to go to to help a conversation? And I'm also curious about like what's like the what's been your most favorite head to head, um, you know, commentary? Are you talking like it does like you put head to head Augustine with somebody else or <laughs> no. C.S. Lewis with somebody else? I mean, what's your what what's been what's been fun for you? I I, I don't know that I, I I can't say that I have a, a favorite kind of head to head um, kind of combative approach. <laughs> I don't. Well, I, you know. I don't. I don't always put uh, figures. Well, we're in the we're we're gonna, we're gonna throw John Wesley and John Calvin, you know, because you're you know. No, anyway, I <laughs> right. and then we'll just we'll have me talking and throw it on the internet, right? <laughs> <laughs> No, um, there is, oh shoot, what's the name of that commentary series that IVP Academic does with the ancient, um, gathers oh. together patristic yeah. sources. Um, I mean, I've, I've drawn on those. I've drawn on, um, most commonly though, for, for most contemporary commentaries, you can get kind of history of research sections in, in the more technical commentaries. But um, more in the last few years, to be honest, I've been reading in conversation um, with um, contemporary uh, scholars who were um, typically people of color and they're reading with their specific racial and ethnic backgrounds and the experiences that they bring to the text to bear on their readings in ways that are self-conscious and self-aware of what they're doing. And uh, so those are those have been actually my most fruitful conversation partners, I would say, I think, in the do last you have any, couple of years. Do you have an example of that? Oh, gosh. Uh, I should have come prepared with specific examples. Um, you know, uh, an example to steal one, um, I've been, I, folks like Mitzi Smith, Shively Smith, there's a lot of um, known, what's known as womanist biblical criticism, a lot of um, women of color writing from the perspectives of women of color who contribute to, to different, um, those are some of the names that kind of come to mind, uh, Renita Weems, others. Um, but um, an example that, that actually, to, to use Miguel de la Torre, uh, who, who uses an example in one of his books on um, the Sabbath command, where he, he tells a story, and I hope I don't botch the details too much, of a uh, pastor of a Spanish-speaking church coming in to a congregation and reading, command six days you must work, and on the seventh day you must rest. And then he has everybody in the, the congregation, he asked them a question, um, how many of you were able to work six days this week? And very few people were able to raise their hands because there was a group of people, uh, largely I believe consisting of migrant workers, who were persistently seeking employment yet unable to find it. Mm -hmm. And so he raises the question, um, how then, if you're unable to work six days, are we going to address the larger structural and systemic challenges that don't allow you to work six days when the Bible clearly says you should and then rest on the seventh. So it's, we typically read it from my position of I need to rest on a seventh. I need to get a day of rest. When in reality, some people don't have the opportunity to do the first part of that is to work six days a week, right? And so um, it was a, a different take from a different socioeconomic location and a different set of experiences that come to the text that really illuminate a different, maybe an alternative way of reading it that I might not have considered on my own. Folks, Ben Espinosa, the next episode is Why God, Why Should I Have a Sabbath? So, man, you're previewing that oh, really right well. So, yeah. so stay tuned. So stay tuned. So 
you know, one of the things um, I appreciate about Northeastern Seminary, you've kind of hinted on this. So we're going to use the word community broadly. You mm-hmm. know, it could be the three of us having a conversation or the four of us, you out there on the Internet. Um, but Northeastern places a high priority on understanding this idea of historical Christianity. So mm-hmm. I, I just want our listener, this is how I kind of study the Bible. So there's three questions I'm always asking. The first one, I think it's the most important. What does this text mean to the original hearers? If mm-hmm. And you've kind of hinted at that, like I walk in with thinking this means this or big deal, but I want to make sure that I'm offended and upset at the things that they're offended and upset by. Mm-hmm. The second question is, what does this passage always mean? So you know, we joked about Martin Luther, but as I kind of see, it's not like the New Testament in 2021. There's been 2,000 years in between. And then that leads me to the last question, which is where I think we jump. What does it mean for us today? So mm-hmm. thinking about that second question, what does it always mean? Why is it important to read in the community you've brought up, the ancient patristics? Why is that important to at least be aware of? Uh, a book that I read in the in the fall um, immediately comes to mind. Um, it was it's it was it's something that it's kind of always been in the back of my mind since I read it. Um, a book by Alan Jacobs called um, "Breaking Bread with the Dead," and his whole thesis is that we should read the Bible, uh, not read the Bible. We should read books by old books by people who aren't still alive. And his his point is in doing so is that. Our social media-driven culture um, right now, our, the latest breaking, the viral video, the whatever, can, can have this paradoxical effect of kind of locking us into a perpetual now, right? That we're, we're constantly just moving down a stream, uh, down a river, you might say, um, guided by the most recent currents. But it's hard to get a perspective on where we are with the larger river in view if you're constantly locked into a perpetual now, mm. right? And so an important, um, an important uh, practice, he says, is to always uh, be reading people you do agree with, you don't agree with, who are offensive, terrible, wonderful, throughout the history of literature um, in order to gain what he calls temporal bandwidth, to get a little bit broader of a perspective to help contextualize what we're experiencing, whether we need to know about, whether we need a broader perspective beyond Twitter or Instagram on um, the racialized violence that's happening in our context or uh, economic inequalities or um, questions of gender and sexuality. And so... The same is true for the Bible, that um, because we approach it from this setting of kind of always being locked into where we are in in this particular moment, reading with ancient voices, reading with voices that are different from our own entering into the conversation, can give a little bit of a broader perspective on different possible ways of engaging these texts. It's almost, it sounds like breathing room, like we're not polarizing or pitting it's like you can take a breath right right and it 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 can exactly it can because we're we're always in a sprint in the perpetual now right and it can give us a a moment to step onto the sideline to use a sports metaphor Um, I remember when I was in playing high school football um, you're in the play play after play after play and at some points you almost forget what the score is because the focus is the next play the next play the next play and when you come out onto the sideline, you finally get a moment to step out of the game to see what's happening on the field from a different vantage point. And it's really similar that I think that we approach the text from the kind of um, constant head-on collisions of our society. Um, but to be able to uh, engage with voices from the past, voices that don't represent where we are in the present, I think that um, it can not only... It can have two really important effects, at least. One is that it can open up new possibilities for ways to engage the text. Because, to be honest, the way we read the Bible as Western white Americans hasn't always been practiced this way in the history of the church. In fact, it's it's kind of a modern phenomenon. 
Mm-hmm. And so if you read Origen, if you read Augustine, if you read Irenaeus and, and other folks from ancient church history, it, you think, wow, they, they inhabit a different world than me, right? So it gives different ways into the text, but importantly, and this is really important for people who represent like the majority culture like I do, it helps you see things about yourself that you wouldn't see otherwise. We always bring baggage to the Bible. We always bring lenses. We always bring, whether we realize it or not, we always bring kind of an agenda or a um, uh, um, an ax to grind or, or you know whatever the metaphor you, you choose. And I'm not always aware of what I'm bringing to the text, right? And, and, and the way I'm maybe at times reading right into the text, things that I'm simply presupposing. But if I represent the majority culture and if I'm only active on social media, we have you know, algorithms that just give me more of what I like to reinforce my own perspectives perpetually. Um, and I think that until I encounter that difference, until I come head to head with a, a, a different viewpoint, a set of different viewpoints that arise from different lived experiences in the world, then I'm, I'm not able to see things about myself that I need to be aware of when I'm reading the Bible. Well, that's really, I, I, um, I think that's, there's a lot of powerful points there. And um, it, Peter, it reminds me of uh, our pastor here, our senior pastor uh, at Browncroft uh, Community Church. You know, he's talked often about that very point. Be careful what you're, reading into the Bible, where you're coming from, you're bringing stuff on your own, take a step back, think about it. Um, what is what is the Bible actually saying in the context that it was said? Right. And then, then go from there. And one of the things about community that I imagine is, um, I think is helpful, is that community, <laughs> other people can keep you accountable to that. I mean, it's easy when, like you said, when you're in the echo chamber of social media, when you're, um, I think, reading the Bible by yourself is important. Um, and uh, in, a, in a quiet place or in a place where you can really concentrate, but it's also important to engage with other people with that because they, number one, they can keep you accountable that you're actually reading. Mm-hmm. Um, and number two, you know, they can challenge you on some things, you know, like, well, why do you, why do you think X? You know, that's not how I saw it at all. It's really fascinated by that. Um, maybe the conversations get a little more spicy then. I don't know, but right. uh, but I think that's uh, I think that's a, a really really strong point. So David, I'm actually going to push Aaron on something. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, hey, wait a away. second. I'm just going to sit back and watch. Well, you, pop- well, you know, you you could jump in. Do I you mean, have any popcorn? <laughs> ooh, this is good. So I mean, our listeners might not know, but you worked in the Senate. You went to church in Washington D.C. Like you literally lived this question out, Democrats, Republicans, progressives, conservatives. I mean, what was it like to walk through that in DC knowing that there were Christians that you take any policy would feel one way or the other? Because this is kind of what David's talking about. I mean, I'd be curious to hear a, a little bit of your experience. Well, I think that's, uh, <laughs> thanks Peter, that's a great question. Um, I, I really, I think that's one of the reasons I keep coming back to the small group setting is I, I was a small group leader there um, in my, my church there. And, and yes, in, in particularly, I think it's like this anywhere in the country, but particularly in D.C., there's strong opinions about lots of mm-hmm. things. And it's not just, I mean, there's definitely the politics. Let's not, that's for sure. And there are strong Christians across the spectrum who have very different ideas. Um, but it's not just that. There's also denominational background. I mean, there's a huge uh, range of thoughts from different denominational backgrounds, from no denomination, and then from people who have never been in a church setting at all. Um, and I think uh, I've, I've found it really interesting to, uh, particularly when you're leading, I imagine it's like this uh, when you're leading in your, your classes also. It's, it is, I, I have thoughts, I have ideas um, about what, you know, pick your Bible passage um, or your your subject, but sometimes you just need to step back and let people talk. And and I I've found that conversations like that are use if people are intellectually honest, they're useful. Um, and uh, you know whether the subject is you know Israel. Israel is a big you know mm-hmm. ancient Israel, contemporary Israel. That's a huge topic. Um, and 
you can, I think you can actually, when you're so surrounded by echo chambers on whether it's on that or something else, um, when you're exposed to people who are, don't see eye to eye with you on everything, number one, you can find out that both of you aren't crazy. You both have good reasons for your opinions. It doesn't mean that there's not room to modify those um, depend after a good conversation. And at the end of the day, even if you don't change your opinion, you're, you, you still learn that you're both people and you both need to be loved. And at the end of the day, you know, Christ loves you and we're, we're, we're on the same team. You mm -hmm. know, we're at the, the basic goals. So, um, yeah, no, thanks, Peter. I think that was a, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but that's where I, 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 I think that those conversations are important. And I know I've learned, um, I've learned a lot from them. I love, by the way, I, I mentioned C.S. Lewis in passing. I love C.S. Lewis and I love how he challenges um, perspectives on things also. And I found that those writings tend to really, I mean, among others, tend to mm -hmm. really get people um, to talk, <laughs> which I think is great. <laughs> right. Right. Well, and now I want to bring both of you back in because this past year we've kind of talked about it. We've talked about the pandemic. You know, we've had, do I wear a mask? Do I not wear a mask? We've had, you know, do I get the vaccine? Do I not get the vaccine? We've had an unbelievably difficult election. Um, that's probably putting it mildly. You know, what might have been different if... Um, if people were engaging the Bible in others in community that might not have, I mean, what do you see? Yeah, um, a couple a couple of things come to mind. I, as I mentioned earlier, I I don't think that um, just the the practice of of reading the Bible in community just by itself is sufficient to address those those problems, right? Um, you you do need. Uh, diverse communities, but you also need what you just mentioned is an openness to hear the voice of others. Um, and I, a, a teaching um, kind of tool that I, I stole from a friend, uh, all of my best ideas come from other people, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that I take from others, is, is to, when, when I raise a given topic, to have people make arguments in favor um, and against and give me two arguments, make it the hill you're going to die on, even if you don't believe it, for why this is the perspective and then argue the same way for the other. So at least in the moment, you have to embody a different perspective, even if for a few minutes. And um, I, so I think reading in communities with people who differ from you, but also that intellectual humility is vital. Um, so I, I think that if people um, were reading the Bible um, in communities like that, it could have a, a genuinely transformative effect, not just on local levels, but on large scale kind of, of levels. And I, and I should add too that, um, you know, I, I've taught the Bible in, in academic context where um, some or even the majority of the audience weren't Christians. They weren't believers, right? And so part of the effort there is to, um, a, a, a necessary effort is to persuade people of why they should read the Bible at all, right, if they're not part of this faith tradition. So I usually, actually, you mentioned Washington, D.C., I will often share um, screen caps of, of tweets by senators that quote the Bible, right? <laughs> and I will point out that these are political figures in Washington, D.C., quoting the Bible in support of political policy stances, right? In our context in the U.S., interpretations of these texts still have material consequences for people's lives and lived in, in real ways that, that make a difference in people's existence, right, on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I think that if, if people... Um, genuinely came together it could um like you mentioned earlier give us a second to, to take a breath it could help us to to hear from one another to engage different perspectives and hopefully to join hands and work for transformation so follow so i guess i um i love that and following up on you know what you just said and kind of where i was going before which peter thanks for that question 
Um, I was thinking about turning a question over to you, but I'll, I'll save that for now. Um, See, you're becoming a good permanent definite uh, maybe co-host. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, why can't, why is it so hard? Like why you, why is it so hard to get to a place? I, I, I would hope, I guess, in a classroom setting, people are there to stretch their intellects. Hopefully they're going to be willing to talk and at the very least you're grading them if they don't do it. So, but why <laughs> in like in general community, um, whether it's in a small group or just people having coffee at a coffee shop or something, why is it so hard to have a real conversation about the Bible, well, really about anything, but about the Bible? Um, what, what's standing in the way and how do we, how do we get past that? I, it, I think if I had the answer to that question, I could be like really important. You know, <laughs> but uh, you are really important. Well, thank you. Thank your, you. Your football career ended on a high, <laughs> you know, high school in Georgia. So right, that's right. you exactly. didn't flame out in the NFL. That's David right. Carr, we love you. <laughs> but um, I, I can only speak from my own experience um, on this. Uh, and um, without going into too much detail, I, I, uh, have very uh, different theological and political viewpoints than those uh, with which I grew up, right? So I'm um, one of, I think, the rare people who has actually um, experienced significant changes in the ways that they think about these things. And I don't mean to to, to say um, I'm special or that that's, you know, to pray that around is a great thing. No, I just mean that it's a it's the truth. I, I've, my perspectives have shifted and changed, and I'm um, wouldn't be surprised at, at all if they continue to do so, for better or for worse. But what what was hard for me um, is that theological ideas, political ideas, ideological ideas aren't simply ideas out there in the abstract. That my the 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 political and theological perspectives that I grew up in were attached to the communities that I grew up in. They were attached to the traditions that I grew up in. And so to transform, to have your experience or your perspective change in a dramatic way, whether it's for good or for bad, can um, very likely alienate you from people that are really important to you. You know, people, friends, family members, who who have who you've grown up with and you love and respect, and if and because because political, ideological, theological ideas are connected with communities, they're also connected with principles, virtues, um, worldviews, and so to to have a major to undergo a major change like that involves socio political transformations friendship change I mean it just the the consequences are like have a ripple effect um, throughout your life and so to to risk a change that has that many consequences is scary right and now I my current theological political ideological whatever viewpoints are also attached to friendships and communities and if I were to depart from it and change again I, I can, the thought of that, I can feel it. You know, I could feel I, the, the risk inherent in making a substantial change like that. And so um, that's part of why converting to a religion like Christianity can be so difficult because it's not just, oh, I thought this and now I think that. It affects every aspect of your life. And so it's, it's not an easy thing to risk, I think. You know, the way that you're talking, it reminds me, Tim Keller tells this beautiful story. He's doing a Bible study with um, uh, the group of people, but there happens to be a lesbian in the in the Bible study. And mm. so they're reading from the epistles. I think it's, I mean, I'm going to be terrible. It's saying you're all sons of God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, he kind of frames it. How is this going to go? You know, and this lesbian says, oh, I get it. Mm -hmm. Like I'm hearing this, if I was a woman back in ancient time and I heard I was a son and this is someone that, you know, probably isn't as connected to Christianity, I would have a higher place. And you just mm -hmm. think of the beauty of that moment, which that 
almost captures better what that passage says than sometimes mm -hmm. we're like, oh yeah, sons of God, like my brother's the oldest, you know, I should, you know, he's a son of God, like, but, but this woman, you know, who probably diametrically opposes and disagrees with Tim Keller on a number of different levels, mm -hmm. picks it, and those are the moments I feel like we're missing. Right, right, and I, yeah, and, and it can be a beautiful thing if we read in community with people of different perspectives, even if we don't fully adopt or at all adopt the perspectives that we're hearing from, mm -hmm. we can still learn from them. And I don't just mean learn from them so we can fight them. I mean, actually, genuinely learn from them, even amidst our disagreements. Mm. Yeah. Hey, I feel like we go like another hour, but you've got some students to teach. Uh, first of all, before we do that, you mentioned before we started, what, what's the class that you teach on the on the Bible? I, I teach different classes, but the one the one class I teach every semester is called Being in the Word, and it is a um, full semester, I mean a one semester sort of track through the Bible um, in as much detail as we can cover, but we cover kind of all the major sections of the Bible with some deeper dives at specific books. Right now I'm teaching it in an eight-week format instead of a 15-week format, so it's a, it's a sprint through the Bible. Well, if you like David Carr, the professor, not the quarterback, sign up for being in the word. So, David Carr, we still love you. So, <laughs> anyway, so. And where can people, where can people find you at uh, Northeastern Seminary? Is there a good, a uh, good place they can look for you on? So they're, not, so they're not tweeting the other David Carr or the other David Carr? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I've abandoned Facebook and I have an Instagram um, account that I think I've, only used one time ever, but I do have a Twitter account. It's at David Carr, which is the reason I'm commonly mistaken for uh -huh. more uh, famous David Carrs on the internet. Um, but we also I have a faculty page uh, on the nes.edu website right. uh, where you can you can find that. So here's how we close. Um, we ask, what does Jesus have to do with this topic? So it's great having academics here because Aaron and I will answer, and whatever we do wrong. Like mm -hmm. you can just clean up the mess. Yeah. So yeah, I'll just shout wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to seminary. You don't pass. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, that's great. Uh, Aaron, why don't you start? Well, I mean, like I said at the beginning, I think this is a uh, important conversation to have. Um, I think that Jesus wants us to be, uh, I, I do think that Jesus wants us to be studying his word, uh, on our own, but I also think that it's important to be doing it in community. And you can even just see how he uh, assembled his disciples. I mean, there were a lot of different perspectives in that group, um, that group of 12, and then I'm sure beyond that, but particularly the group of 12. And I'm sure they challenged each other, um, certainly while they were walking around with Jesus. And, and, and then uh, later on in the early church, I'm sure that they kind of, um, they were, I'm, I, I'm sure looking out for each other, but also I'm sure they challenged each other. In fact, we know, um, not that Paul was one of the original 12, but Peter and Paul, they had their, their own conversations, very public conversations, and um, the Lord used that. Um, the Lord used that to, uh, to help them and help the, the church. So I think that that's, I think this is a really important topic, and, um, you know, I definitely want to I think to me it just uh, underlines again how important it is to be part of um, a community of people in church, uh, but also small groups, uh, a place where you can get challenged, a place where you can try to take your own blinders off. And uh, yeah, I'm glad we had this conversation today. Mm -hmm. Sounds like your class would be really cool to sit in on too. Thank, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I really appreciate that. And uh, like those comparisons with Jesus and his disciples, I am... Um, I've been doing a lot of work on John 3 lately, and what I love about John 3 with Nicodemus is, so Nicodemus, you know, is studying, you know, the Old Testament in community, and he goes to Jesus because he thinks he's going to win the fight. And we read John 3, 16, and we think that's this beautiful verse that we throw up at ball games, mm -hmm. but, like, Jesus like challenges his assumptions of how he reads scripture. Jesus challenges what he thinks about himself. And then at the end of it, Jesus wins the argument, but loses his life. Hmm. And he says, you know, I've, I've come not to condemn, but to love the world. 
And I just think about what a model that is for us that even in the act of reading the Bible in community, whether we're going to someone like Augustine or Irenaeus or whether we're sitting with a group of people that we disagree community in community, that it's not about winning the argument, but it's actually this is an act of dying to myself, dying to what Jesus asked me to, not necessarily giving up, you know, orthodoxy or what's important, but to be able to live with intellectual humility because Jesus is the Lord. So that's what I'm leaving with. Thank you. Am I supposed to answer that? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So you're supposed to clean up our mess. Yeah. uh, You did great. Uh, (laughs) No, when I, it did an a good job. (laughs) Jesus, Jesus, um, because we exist from a place of where we presume autonomous individualism, right? I, I, me, myself, and I, this, I view the world through my individualistic lenses. Um, some of the, 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 the biblical authors presumed community more so than, you know, mm-hmm. needed to address why it should some, be a reality for people. And um, the, cent- the central message and the, um, what governed Jesus' mission was the kingdom of God. And what I like about centralizing that message of God's reign um, going forth into the world in ways that work for justice, that are governed by love, that create life-giving community, is that um, by turning our attention off of ourselves towards that larger agenda, which is governed by sacrificial love, then it can reorient the ways we engage with the Bible and with one another. And so it's, it's you know, you read Paul's letters, it's, uh, it's kind of comforting to know that the earliest writer in the New Testament um, was addressing problems from the earliest stages. So it's, it's normal and Christian in some ways to not have it together. But um, at the same time, he continually used that, that um, sort of almost like a rubric of Jesus is giving on behalf of others to be the the model for how communities should function in life together under the reign of the kingdom of God. So that's that's where my mind goes. Well, um, we can drop the mic on that. We thank you for the original David Carr. And uh, hey, uh, the best thing you can do to not miss a Why God Why is go to whygodwhypodcast.com and subscribe. We'll be tagging uh, David just on on Twitter, maybe Instagram, but uh, be there. So check out these next episodes. Thanks so very much. Yeah.